I invite you to turn to Acts chapter 2 in the New Testament. We're continuing our series in the Acts of the, the Holy Spirit. And as we mentioned before, uh, we're focusing on the work of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, and the development of the church and of disciples of Jesus Christ. And Acts is going to lead us in that discussion. Um, the text, as Warren mentioned, is a pivotal text in Acts. It's a, really a foundational text in this book. It's laying, uh, or continuing, really, to lay down the foundation for where Luke is going to go in the rest of this book. And so the things that we're reading about now and hearing about now and learning about now um, will continue to play out throughout the book of Acts. These are important, vital, fundamental things for us to understand and know and experience as disciples of, of Jesus. Now one of the things that I, I try to do as I come up here and I, I talk a little bit about um, these texts is to connect it into the bigger picture the bigger story, the bigger drama of God, if you will. And so we kind of jump into different places of Scripture. For example, this morning we're going to be in 1 Kings and Ezekiel, of all places. And I do that purposely just so, hey, 1 Kings and Ezekiel are not separate from the story that's being told here in Acts. And that we can connect themes and understandings and doctrine of what God is doing. It's a continuous one story. And to help us to see that big picture of what God is doing and continues to do today, right? We've said we're in Act 4, if you will. Act 1 was God creating all things and creating us. We call that reign. It's where we find out his fundamental identity of who he is and who we are. That we're created as image bearers of God in Mago Day and in his likeness. And the second act is rebelling. Rebellion, sin, our fall, bringing evil and injustice into the world which necessitates Act 3, God's saving us, God providing for us what we could not provide ourselves, and ultimately that is fulfilled in and through His Son, Jesus Christ, His perfect life, His death, His resurrection, and His ascension, and His coming again. And this chapter really marks the beginning of Act 4. It's the, the church and the disciples of Jesus living out the truths of Jesus, proclaiming the good news and living out those truths as his disciples, they, to give a glimpse and a taste of the kingdom of God that has arrived in Christ and now is being demonstrated through, through his church. But again, it's just a foretaste of the future of God's kingdom coming. So we are in that story. We are participants in that story right now in Act 4, and it begins right here. And we sung this already, God with us, uh, Jesus being our deliverer, uh, but now he's nearer to us in a special way, and that is through the Holy Spirit indwelling us. And this is what we see here in a visible, tangible kind of way. Uh, this is one of those kind of what I've called fantastical stories. It, it borders on, as it, borders, it surpasses really our imaginations described with words. You're going to see that. Luke can't even describe it. The disciples can't even describe it. It was like this. It was like that. But it wasn't that because we don't have words for what just took place. We need images. And God gives us images, earthly images, bread and wine, simple things, wind and fire we look at here to remind us of speech, too, to remind us of who he is and what he has done. All right, so the disciples are together. There's about 120 of them. So it's the apostles and the disciples. They have gathered. All right, Jesus has already ascended. He told them to stay put in Jerusalem until they were going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's the fulfillment, or this is the fulfillment of that promise from Jesus, and from John the Baptist, for that matter, too, that we saw as we were looking at the Gospel of Matthew, when John the Baptist says when he's baptizing Jesus, he's like, I baptize you with water, but Jesus is going to baptize you with pneuma, with wind, with spirit, and fire. This is the fulfillment of that happening. So they're together, about 120 of them, when this is taking 
place. So with that in mind, I read uh, Acts chapter 2, first 13 verses, and then we'll dive farther into this. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and resident, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others, mocking, said, They are filled with new wine. Heavenly Father, as we take a look at these very important words that were inspired and written down by your Holy Spirit, may we be open to the work that you want to do in our lives to shape us more into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. It's his name that we pray. Amen. Well, many of you know that, and I mentioned this a couple Sundays ago, that I'm, I'm an A's fan. In the Oakland A's, they did something that no other team uh, did in baseball uh, quite a while back. Back in 1981, 1981, there was a, there was a hit song. They hit the, the pop charts. Anybody want to venture a guess what the number one song in 1981 was? Got a little funk to it. Cool in the game. Celebration. Celebration. Thank you, Michelle. The song Celebration. Uh, some of us might know that song, but what the A's did every time that they won a game, there was a cause for celebration. So that song hit number one. It was popular. So they started playing Celebration after every game that they won. And they're still doing that to this day. It became part of their tradition to celebrate with that song. Now, the Jews know how to celebrate as well. God is a God of celebration. Um, sometimes we, we forget that. God is a God of joy and a God of, of delight. And he created festivals for uh, the people, the Jewish folks, the Israelites, to celebrate and to recognize who God is and what he has done for them. So there were festivals that um, they were required to be a part of. And hopefully it wasn't something that was duty for them, but it was delight for them. And there's three festivals that were what they called pilgrimage festivals, or travel festivals. And these festivals meant that wherever you were in the world, if you were a male, you needed to go to Jerusalem to celebrate these festivals. And the first festival is one that we're familiar with. We've already talked about this one. It's Passover. Passover was the first festival. At Passover, all the Jews, male Jews, would come to Jerusalem, which is why there were so many people in Jerusalem when Jesus entered in and when he was crucified. He was crucified on Passover. He was the Passover lamb. And he took the Passover and made it into the Lord's Supper, a sacrament that we now celebrate. Okay. Then there was another one that was called the Feast of Booths, or Tabernacles. And this focused on God's faithfulness and provision for the Israelites when they were wandering in the desert after they'd been rescued by God from Pharaoh and from Egypt by the ten, from the ten plagues, of which the last one was the Passover plague, which is where that came from. They were required to live in booths, to create little temporary, well, let me back up here. While they're in the wilderness, this is where they lived in. They lived in booths. Little tabernacles, little dwellings that were portable that they can take up and take out, like our tents today. Just little tents that they can pop up pretty easily and take down, and wherever they moved, they would put those back up again. And they were to do that 
even to this day, to build booths to live in for a week to remember of their humble beginnings. That no matter how prosperous they were going to get into the manger in the promised land, they were going to remember that God is faithful, but that they are needy and they're the ones that, that receive. They're going to live in little booths for them. But the middle one was the Feast of Weeks. It was called the Feast of Weeks because it happened seven weeks after Passover. So, which was also called Pentecost, which was 50, because it started, the counting started the day after Passover. So 50 days after Passover, the, the day after Passover, they had another celebration, the Feast of, of Weeks. And this feast was the Feast of Harvest. It was a celebration of God's provision and, and bounteous provision for, for them. And really their trust because it happened between uh, two crops, the harvest of one and the beginning of of the other, that they were going to be dependent on God for his reign and his provision for them. It's at this feast, the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, that this event occurs on. Now the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Harvest was tied with another feast. It wasn't a travel feast, but they were already there, so it didn't really matter. Feast of First Fruits. Again, this ties into harvest. Um, it was the, the giving of the first fruits to God, saying that you deserve the best, you deserve the first, you deserve ultimately because you're the one that provides for us. And what we're going to see here um, is that Jesus is the first fruit when he rose again from the dead of all of what we are going to be in the future. And that even the New Testament says we are also a kind of first fruit in, in Christ. So these feasts are important. The Feast of Pentecost, when this happens, they're all together in, a, in probably a space like this. There's 120 of them. But we don't know where this is. It doesn't say. Some say it's the upper room, but I doubt it. I've been in the upper room, and it's pretty small. And you get 120 people in there, you're going to be kind of crunched together. So we don't know. But probably a space like this. So just imagine this. 100 of us, 120 of us stood together. And we're waiting, because Jesus said to wait. And they're trying to figure out, what does it mean to be baptized with the Holy Spirit? With wind and fire, they, they had this prophecy from Jesus that this was going to happen shortly. And they're all waiting. And you got all these Jews that are coming from all over the world to, to come to Jerusalem to celebrate. This is happening at the same, same time. And it looks as suddenly, just boom, just bam, out of nowhere, something like a mighty rushing wind. Is heard. This is the first sign that God gives of Pentecost, of His presence, of the Holy Spirit being there. The sign of sound. Something like a mighty wind. It wasn't wind, it was like the mighty wind. The best they could describe it, it was just something was there that we heard, and it was mighty. And the closest thing that we can get to was wind. Now, God has used wind in the past as well to represent his power and to represent his spirit from the Old Testament. Anybody know any stories in the Old Testament? There's multiple. But I mentioned I'm going to Ezekiel, so maybe Ezekiel might tip you off just a little bit. This is another fantastical story. There's, there's a vision here of the Valley of Bones. Remember this story? The Valley of Bones? There's... God gives Ezekiel a vision of, of bones and just tons of bones out in the valley. That's all he sees. And God tells Ezekiel to prophesy to the wind, to the pneuma. And he does. He prophesies to it and speaks to it. And this wind comes and it rattles these bones and, and brings them all back together and puts flesh and they become living beings once again. This mighty wind of God takes dead, dry bones and brings them back to life. That's the power of God regenerating and bringing life, wind, power, God. That's what's happening right here. They would associate wind and power and God together with something miraculous that was happening, something regenerative, something good that was happening to them, something to celebrate. Shara and I had experience of this as well. When we were, I think I mentioned this story once before, but it's so appropriate for her here. We uh, went to uh, Folsom 
when we planted the church with Tim and Betsy Blackman, uh, it seems many moons ago now. But it was before we actually started, and we had not even stepped foot in there yet, where we had been called to go. And so we drove up from Southern California and we borrowed my parents' Yukon, and we went up to one of the top hills in Folsom, overlooking the city, both east and, and west. And after a time being up there, just kind of surveying our, our Canaan, if you will, our, our promised land, if, if you will, uh, we, we gathered together at the end before we were going to go back down, and we kind of huddled together and we prayed. And while we were, it was a still day, while we were praying, all of a sudden this wind kind of just whipped up kind of right around us. There was no wind blowing in the trees. There was tall green grass because it was the spring, and the wind was just blowing right here around us. And, I mean, it almost moved us a little bit. It was powerful, right? We're still telling the story. That was the Spirit of God. That was the Holy Spirit. That was not wind. That was the Spirit of God there, no doubt about it, just like here, to show that this was his calling and his blessing to, to do this. Spirit of God, mighty like the wind. That was the first sign that God gave of an inward reality that was going to take place. This was a, an outward visible sign. It was visible was auditory at this point. He was going to give them a visual here in a second. That was the first sign to say, hey, this is really happening. I'm not just telling you it's happening. You're seeing it and hearing it and experiencing it. So you can write about this too. So the second, so you get sound, right? This mighty, mighty wind. Uh, the next one is sight. Something like tongues of fire. They were not tongues of fire. I know we have representation of that there. But it was not tongues of fire. It was the Holy Spirit. Again, they could not describe it. It was like tongues of fire. It's the best they could do. And again, under the um, inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this was tying into biblical themes, right? So if they knew their scripture, and Jews knew their scripture really well, they're, they're going to go, oh man, fire, God, wind. This is all starting to make sense. Although they say it in here, what does this all mean? They still need some interpretation here, but if they were good Jews, they would know some of these stories. Do you know some stories from the Old Testament of God and fire? There's quite a few of them that we can, we can go to. The burning bush is a simple one, right? Fire, burning bush, God revealing himself. And the bush is not burning. Why? Because it's not fire, it's God. His presence there. Or maybe the pillars of fire, when the Israelites are, are free from the exodus, and God in these pillars of fire leads his people. So fire, again, is associated with, with God and his power, his leading, and his, his saving. And so they were going to be able to connect this together, this sound of mighty wind and the sight of tongues of, of fire with the giving of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Now, what's really interesting uh, with this, and you, you, I've, I've been alluding to this, I've been up front with this, that the Holy Spirit is not the fire, and he's not the wind. Now, there's a story in the Old Testament that also speaks of this. First Kings. First Kings. This, this is, man, I can spend my whole morning talking about this. This is the story of Elijah, right? So Elijah has just defeated the the prophets of Baal, and God brought fire down on the altar and consumed it after he doused it with tons of water. It was an amazing, powerful event that Elijah just defied Jezebel and her prophets. Great declarative um, story and image and experience of God's power. Well, it's just the next day that uh, someone tells Jezebel about what happens, and Jezebel swears she's going to kill Elijah by sundown the next day. And Elijah freaks out, and he becomes a coward, and he runs and hides himself in a cave. God goes to him in this cave and says, no, I get up out of this cave, come on. Go up and go stand in front of the mountain here. I'm going to encourage you here that I am with you. And what happens? A mighty wind passes in front of Elijah. Now, this is some kind of wind. It tears the mountain apart, and it breaks rocks into two. That's a wind, all right? 
Then an earthquake, and earthquakes happen. So the ground is starting to shake, the wind is blowing, the rocks are cracking, the mountains coming apart. Now that's not enough. What happens after that? Fire appears all over the place. And so at the end of this, it says with each one of these, but God was not in the, the wind or the earthquake or the fire. A gentle little voice came afterwards, and Elijah covers his head because he knows the presence of God is there in that. And then, interesting, this is the humor part of God, too. You've got to be laughing at this. He says, Elijah, where, what are you doing here? Where, where is he now? You, you don't know this story yet. He, he's back in the cave again. So God called him out of the cave to go out to show him his mighty power and presence. He got scared to death with what was going on, and he scurried right back into the cave of Jesus. He felt it was safer to be protected in the cave from the wind and the, the fire and the, the earthquakes. And God said, what are you doing here? Anyways, he's not in the wind. He's not in the fire. The same thing that's going on here. But we have the real presence of the Holy Spirit coming down on the disciples here. And then the third thing, the final sign, is speech. To show that there was an inward power that was happening within these disciples, they began to speak, not in uh, unintelligible language, but in intelligible language, just different cultural languages. It was like if Art all of a sudden started speaking Finnish, and Shar starts speaking Chinese, right, and Tom starts speaking Indian. Um, and, you know, we just start speaking languages that we don't know. And it's showing that it's the Holy Spirit in them that's empowering them and equipping them to be able to speak in languages for the people. Now, remember the scene here. So they're in Jerusalem. They're gathered together. you got this mighty wind that has happened. you got the fires that have come down. Now, this happened all in, like, a few seconds. This gets out, and word gets out that wind and fire, and you're starting to get a lot of people that are gathering. Next week, as we talk a little bit about Peter's response, you're going to see that at least 3,000 people are starting to gather around what's going on here. Because 3,000 repent and bend their knees to the living God, to, to Jesus Christ, because of, there had to have been more there. This is quite the scene. So there's people, Jews from all over the world. We read that list that was going there. There's 12 different groupings there, and I don't say this, but I think it matches the, the 12 apostles and the 12 tribes saying this is, this is complete and the message is going to be complete. The message is going to go out to this entire world. And what is the message? What were they all declaring in the various languages? The mighty acts of God. The mighty acts of God. And if you had to declare the mighty acts of God, what would you include in that list? What would that be? Well, we're going to see Peter's response next week. We're going to spend a lot of time unpacking, but it's the gospel. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus just lived the perfect life. He was crucified. He rose from the dead. They were witnesses to this, the twelve, and many of the others uh, around. And then he ascended to heaven. Those were the key elements of the mighty acts of God, but there was also the exodus, the burning bush, the visions, all this other stuff that we can uh, add in there as well, the mighty acts of God. Now, some people see this as um, the reversal of Babel. Reversal of Babel. So I'm actually bringing in Genesis here as, as well. Remember the story of the Tower of Babel? Or Babel? Like Babel, because it was Babel, what they ended up doing, uh, what they sound like to one another. But the people came together, came as one to do what? To make a name for themselves. And they, they were going to do this by building a mighty tower up to God. They were going to build a tower to God to make a name for themselves. You guys said, nah, nah, that's not going to happen on my watch. And he does something simple. He just confuses their language so that they can't understand each other anymore. If you can't, you're not building something magnificent. You can't understand each other anymore. And then he sends them across the face of the earth. Then, okay, that's taken care of, and they abandoned the project. This is the undoing of that. See, people are coming together, 
But what's the purpose? Is it to make a name for themselves? No, it's to declare the mighty acts of God and to declare the glory and the majesty and the power of, of God. And it is, is there the division the and the spreading out with the unintelligible languages? No, it's the, the coming together and everyone's able to hear the message all in their own language. It's a powerful demonstration and visual of the undoing of Babel, where people in their sinful nature came to declare and, and make a name for themselves. And now, through the Spirit, the Holy Spirit living within us, because of the finished work of Jesus Christ, are now declaring the glories and excellencies of God together, and doing that in a unified way, that every person, you can see people from here, all different tribes and colors and, and nationalities, coming together, doing the same thing together, worshiping God as one. We're going to see that through um, this book and throughout, actually throughout the entire New Testament where it talks about us coming together as disciples um, to see past our little petty differences into the, the bigger unifying picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ where we are one, that we identify with Christ and not with the things of this world that pull us away from Christ and cause divisions within our church. I'm going to finish with this. Actually, what Warren alluded to. There's going to be scoffers. There are people there that they're drunk. It's nine in the morning. They're not drunk. Peter's going to say next week. All right. The illusion here is what Luke is getting at. They were. He said, "People are going to think you're filled with wine." You're filled with something hallucinatory that's causing all of this, something natural that's happening here. And Luke wants us to be crystal clear that what's happening here is that the disciples of Jesus, their baptism in the Holy Spirit is a filling with the Holy Spirit. That they're not filled with wine. And Peter's going to demonstrate that next week when we're going to look at the church as it comes together and the acts that they did toward one another was not because of a filling of wine or any other type of external man-made creatory kind of thing, creation, but it was the Holy Spirit, that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's what it means to be a disciple of Christ, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That he regenerates us and shapes us and conforms us and equips us and empowers us sanctifies us, makes us more like Christ. We need to give more honor and glory to the Holy Spirit, more attention to the Holy Spirit. He's kind of like the lost stepbrother. We just don't think about a whole lot. We pray that we recognize the work of the Holy Spirit in our own lives and the life of this church. Now we give him the honor and glory and praise. The last song we're going to be singing, King of Kings, does that. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. This is why we draw attention to the Trinity over and over again. We serve a triune God, a powerful God who is for us and with us for his glory and our joy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this amazing, true historical event that in time and space, you sent your Holy Spirit upon your disciples as a sign that you indwell all those that you call your children, all those who are beloved by grace, not because of anything that we've done to earn it, that we might declare the excellencies of, of you and the amazing finished work that Jesus has done for our salvation and the ongoing work that he continues to do today through the Holy Spirit to make more and better disciples of yours who live in missional community with one another as light in this world. So Lord, may we be empowered and filled with your Spirit that we might, as individuals, as this church, declare the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ, verbally, and to visibly live out those truths in the way that we love one another 
and love others who are not like us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.